somebody say amen. Come on, somebody say amen. Come on, if you would stand to your feet and give God the praise. Come on, give God a hand clap of praise this morning. He is worthy to be praised. Come on, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, our God is worthy to be praised. Who is this king of glory? He's the Lord strong and mighty. We're going to lift our hands. We're going to lift our voice. Come on, we're going to celebrate because Jesus is alive. Amen. Come on, and he is, he is healing. He is setting free. He is delivering. He is our all. Come on, we're 
somebody to clap your hands. Come on, wherever you are, if you are watching us, on Facebook or YouTube, I need you to clap your hands. Come on, good morning, God. We're going to give your name all the glory because you are an awesome God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that in fellowship we can come together, even through technology, Father, to experience and walk with Jesus and the disciples on Holy Tuesday. Open our hearts, anoint our minds, so that we can understand the richness that he has left for us in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Good afternoon. My name is Catherine Pullen, a lifelong member of Tabernacle Baptist Church, and it's my privilege to be able to present to you a brief overview of Christ's actions on Holy Tuesday. This week is Passion Week. We get to walk with Jesus on his way to the cross. Holy Tuesday is the third day of Passion Week, and again, it leads to Christ's crucifixion and his resurrection. Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Resurrection Sunday. Yesterday, you heard about Holy Monday. The scriptures highlighted for Holy Tuesday are as follows, so please get your pen and paper, or unless you really have a really great memory. Here we go. It's Matthew, 21st chapter, and 23rd verse through Matthew, chapter 23, and the 39th verse. Mark, 11th chapter, 27th verse, through Mark, 12th chapter, 44th verse. And lastly, Luke, 20th chapter, 1st verse through the 21st chapter and the 4th verse. These verses are full of confrontation by the Sadducees and the Pharisees, those who are the keepers of the temple and keepers of the law. And in all of this confrontation and chaos that they, call, they caused, they wanted to come across as being genuine. They wanted to come across as someone who, or a group that wanted to seek wisdom, when really what they wanted to do was to trap Jesus and find fault with him. So throughout these verses, these chapters, they ask a lot of questions, and Jesus answers them in a way that only Jesus can. But to the point that I want to make, the Sadducees and Pharisees were pretenders. They were not people who really wanted to know. They wanted to use Jesus' words against them. And remember that as we go forward. Again, these scriptures are very full of, of Christ's actions and experiences and his message and his actions illuminate his word for us for practical everyday living. There is freedom in Christ. I will focus on, and I hope you can get there and, and use any version that works for you. Uh, the King James Version is very difficult for some people, so uh, you can use the NIV or uh, one that works for you. The one that I have now is the MacArthur Study Bible, large print, New American Standard Bible Version. Okay, these verses again will illuminate, and so let's go right to the text. We're starting at Mark 11, 11, and going uh, forward. It says, Jesus entered Jerusalem and came into the temple, and after looking around at everything, he left for Bethany with the 12th, that's the disciples, since it was already late. Okay, what's the significance of him looking around? Just... That's all the text says. He looks around. 
it shows that he has the authority to make sure that his father's house is in order. He has the authority and he showed the authority. He has the right to investigate to see if his father's house is in order. That's one point. So now I am going to focus on one of the greatest pretenders in the word and that's the fig tree that Jesus cursed. Let us go on again. Mark 11, we're at 12 now. On the next day, remember he investigated, took authority to make sure that his father's house was in order. On the next day, when they had left Bethany, he became hungry. Seeing at a distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if perhaps it would he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. He said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. Now, wait a minute. This doesn't sound like the Jesus we've heard of. We've heard of Jesus healing, raising the dead, providing for the 3,000 and the 5,000. We... What's he angry about? It didn't make sense to me for many, 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 many years. And I'm going to say hats off to Reverend Dr. Brenda Thomas, who actually preached this some years ago from the pulpit and that allowed me to better understand it. And uh, of course, researchers as well, looking at commentaries. Specifically, it is said that the fig tree represents Israel. And the Sadducees and the Pharisees in particular, because they were pretending to be something they weren't, someone who cares, something who, someone who was willing to sit at Jesus' feet and understand what was going on and wanted some wisdom, when really what they wanted to do was to use that information to work together to see if they could find fault in what he said. Specifically, it says, here Jesus cursed the tree for its misleading appearance that suggested great productivity. It suggested that it could meet a need that a traveler might have because it is said that fig tree was out in the public space so it was available to people and the fruit would come first and then the leaves. But it was a false message. There was nothing there but the appearance of being able to provide. That's important to note. Whether it is spiritually, mentally, or emotionally, we do not want pretenders to come into our lives and affect our future. Meaning, you need to assess. Remember, Jesus took authority. He took authority because he had authority. As believers in Christ, we have the Holy Spirit. And our authority comes through our discernment of what's going on in our lives to assess if there are pretenders there. Pretenders who say, I'm okay and I'm really not. Pretenders who might say, I love you, and maybe they don't. And guess what? We have to ask ourselves, are we pretenders? We may have been in church a very long time, but are we here because Big Mama brought us or Mama brought us? We have to have a relationship in Christ for ourselves. Okay, so let's go on again. Still in Mark 11, but going to verse 20. Here's one that seemed not to make, as they were passing by in the morning, that means the next day after he cursed the the tree and said, no one will ever eat from you again. So as they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. Being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look at the fig tree, which you cursed. It has withered. And this seems kind of a strange transition the way that Jesus responded to him. He said, he answered them, have faith in God. Wait a minute. I'm talking about a tree. I'm just saying, look, Jesus, it, it, it withered. 
Okay, let's go on a little further. Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea and does not doubt in their heart. So remember that. And does not doubt in their heart, but leaves, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted to him. So, like I said, it seemed like a, a left there for Jesus. We're talking about the, the fig tree. It really uh, died like you said, Jesus, and Jesus turned and said that about faith. Well, when you read certain commentaries, it says that was uh, Jesus' gentle rebuke of Peter and the rest of the disciples. They were all there. Because why would Peter even mention it? Like, oh, it really happened. Wait a minute. Peter and the disciples, didn't you just hear Jesus, who you're following as the Messiah? And you've just, he's just been ushered into Jerusalem as a king on a donkey. And then your, your, your comment is more like a surprise. Look, Jesus, it withered. Jesus, knowing his heart, knowing the minds of the disciple, wanted to gently, because you've heard him say before, oh, ye of little faith. But this time it was very gentle. And he said, if you have faith and believe and do not doubt in your heart, it will, the things that you ask will happen. So again, this is another opportunity to ask ourselves, is there any doubt in us? We'll say, won't he do it? We'll say, uh, I believe in the Lord. I believe what he says, but do we? As it says, when we even do communion, which we just observed uh, on the first Sunday, to examine yourself. And that's something that many of us don't do. We get caught up in the routine of church. We get caught up in the busyness of church. But as Pastor Thompson said many, many years ago, don't let the busyness of church confuse you with church business. And I don't mean specifically the local church. So this is a time of reflection. Here, what we want to get to is that there are pretenders in our lives and we want to make sure that we identify them so we can remove ourselves from those pretenders, those who seem like they're going to provide something. Again, as I said before, whether it be love, whether uh, it be opportunity, we want to make sure that we don't waste time because pretenders can waste part of the future that God has for you in Christ. And very importantly, we need to ask ourselves if we are pretenders. Let that spiritual reflection reveal to you who you really are in Christ. If you're unsure, now is the time to surrender fully. He died for us so that we can be reconciled to God in him. Even though we're not going to talk a lot about John, let's remember John 3.16. You maybe prayed over this uh, verse. I know I did with my grandson. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Let us pray. Father, we're so thankful that as believers and those who are searching can come together for a single purpose, and that is to walk with Christ on his way to the cross. We love you and we bless your name. And we thank you of how you are going to illuminate this word and the words leading up to Resurrection Sunday so that we can rejoice in Resurrection Sunday. We are resurrected people. 
We love you. You have demonstrated your love through us, and we bless your holy name. In Jesus' name and for his sake, thank you. Thank you for your time and your attention.